Hi, everyone. Uh, every day on the community team at Mapbox, we have the absolute privilege of working with people who are doing incredibly impactful work with maps. Um, and what we get to do is uh, unblock them on anything that they need in order to use Mapbox to work with the OpenStreetMap community or connect with folks like you who are within the community of people who want to have maps that make a difference. So I feel really honored uh, today to bring up three people that represent projects that we work with um, all the time on the community team. Um, and we're going to have a conversation, share what we do with maps, talk about the people that we work with, and talk about the challenges that we have um, trying to have an impact on the world with maps. So please, let's welcome Emily Jacoby from Digital Democracy, Anya Ahern, who's representing Visualize No Malaria, and Nathan Williams from the Town Hall Project. Welcome. So what we're going to do is um, start off uh, with each of us spending two, three minutes presenting our work so you know a little bit more about what we do. And then we have time for a conversation. I'll start off by asking questions, but I'm not going to be the only person who's asking questions. Everyone here, we're very curious about each other and our, each other's work. I hope that you're curious, too. So if anything strikes you that you would love us to talk about, please raise your hand. And, um, and direct us to where you think we should go with the conversation. And without further ado, Emily, please start us off. I'll give you the clicker. Great. Hi, everyone. So Digital Democracy is a nonprofit that's focused on doing technology solidarity work with marginalized groups. That means that we really recognize our partners as experts. And so we might come in with technology expertise, but they have expertise around their lived situation. So whether it's environmental threats or human rights abuses, we're helping them leverage technology to advocate for their own rights. Today, I'm going to just briefly tell a story about work we've been doing in the Amazon rainforest with the Warani who are an indigenous group. We've been working with the organizations Amazon Frontlines and Alianza Sabo, which is a network of four indigenous nationalities. And the Warani, as you can see from this map, live in an area that's about a million um, hectares of land in, deep in the Amazon rainforest. It's some of the most biodiverse area left on the planet. And they are facing threats from oil companies. Um, the Ecuadorian government just announced this spring that they're going to auction off new um, new oil blocks within the heart of their territory, where we've actually been doing, doing mapping for the past three years. So they asked us to help them create an online interactive map that could really tell the story of their situation. So as you zoom in, you can see the way that the Ecuadorian government has carved up oil blocks throughout their territory. And what they wanted to do is show that their land is not just empty green space, but it actually is full of plants and animals and sacred sites and all these different things that they have a deep relationship with. They told me, we want to create a map full of things that don't have a price to show the impact of what will happen if oil companies actually come in. I encourage you to go to our website, check out the link to their map. It's really incredible. There you go. Hmm? That's you. Yep. Hi, I'm Nathan Williams. Um, I am with Town Hall Project. Uh, we're a civic engagement project that tries to motivate elected officials to meet with their constituents and tries to motivate constituents to speak out more to their elected officials. So, um, you know, if you flash back to a year ago and change, early 2017, the political landscape in this country had changed pretty dramatically in a way that was dislocating to a lot of people. Um, and I'm a, I'm a former campaign person and um, with, together with some friends, we thought back to 2009 when uh, Democrats had taken power in all branches of government for the first time in a long time and how it seemed like they had all this momentum. And then throughout 2009 at town hall meetings across the country, incumbent Democrats just kept getting their ass kicked by the Tea Party. I don't know if people remember this. Um, Tea Party folks were showing up and just intimidating uh, members of Congress, and really affected legislation in a pretty dramatic way. The Affordable Care Act was moved significantly because of grassroots efforts. Um, and not being a Tea Party member or not having a specific core agenda, um, some friends of mine and I said, 
hey, this can be another moment where grassroots energy can make a difference. So we started out just in our spare time uh, and some fellow volunteers putting together a list of congressional town halls because there was no central database of all these things. Um, we thought it would be useful to a few um, other activist groups around the country, uh, but within 24 hours, uh, it went viral, it became huge, Lin-Manuel Miranda tweeted about us, and we were really overwhelmed because we thought it was just a side project. So um, a very talented developer reached out to us and said, hey, I can help you make a website because <laughs> we're, not, we're not tech people especially, um, and it became Town Hall Project, uh, townhallproject.com. Uh, and we track every public event uh, with members of Congress, um, activist groups who are trying to pressure members of Congress, and we try to mobilize people um, effectively to them. Um, so as you can see, we've got you know, in-person events um, and other types of events. Um, what we found is that we weren't just you know, researching these events. We were actually you know, motivating people and mobilizing people. And you see people use our map in different ways. Um, we did a group, uh, a, a series of town halls with um, uh, the March for Our Lives organization, and students around the country uh, used our maps, uh, you know, effectively. And then people also guilt their members of Congress. You can see, um, you know, Andy Harris in Maryland holding a town hall in a very inaccessible spot, uh, and people learning more about their districts, learning more about members of Congress that try to be, try to look like they're accessible but really aren't. Um, and we're excited about, you know, what the future holds. We have a new map uh, launching today, I think. Can I say it? <laughs> Townhall, <laughs> Townhallpledge.com. We're making uh, members of Congress take a pledge or candidates take a pledge. Um, we've got some rapid response to potential constitutional crisis maps, and we're moving into state legislatures. So I hope to talk to more about all that stuff. Yay. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Anya Ahern, and I uh, founded and run a consulting company that does data visualization called Datablick. Um, and my normal client wheelhouse are people like Apple and Kaiser and Cisco and Visa, but as part of a volunteer effort, um, I had the opportunity to support an organization called PATH, and I think Robin is here from PATH, um, in conjunction with Tableau for an initiative called Visualize No Malaria. Um, and the initial project was to help develop some data visualizations and dashboards for, and this is kind of one of my target user audiences, this, um, the gentlemen in the orange t-shirts are community health workers out in Zambia. And the goal was to help develop tools and analytic products to support them um, in their efforts as they went out to these local villages in order to test people for the malaria parasite and provide medicine and other control um, vectors such as in, uh, indoor spray for, against the mosquitoes and bed nets. Um, and so working in Tableau and with the, uh, the team at Mapbox, we uh, wanted to be able to help show them what the power of data visualization could do for them, uh, to listen to them and understand their use cases of what tools we might develop that would help them and support their efforts on the ground in Zambia. Um, and also uh, kind of bring awareness to the fight against malaria. Um, and so this is just an example of one of the maps that we developed. Um, Alan Walker from Mapbox did a viewshed analysis of the cell towers. Um, and we were looking to understand, as you saw those gentlemen in the orange shirts, often transmit data only via cell phone. They don't have laptops. Um, they don't have any other way to access the data. So it was very important to be under, understand which uh, health facilities and health workers were in and out of range of a cell tower. And so the pink dots are those that are in little pockets of kind of cell dead zone, um, which affect our ability to effectively capture data on malaria incidents and therefore report on it and allocate resources effectively to be able to fight it. Um, as a part of working with PATH and the Zambian Ministry of Health, we not only wanted to develop analytics and dashboards for them, but we wanted to be able to teach them how to perform their own analysis in Tableau and Mapbox. So here's a training of all the district health officers or information officers in the southern province of Zambia, um, really learning to take advantage of the types of tools like Tableau and Mapbox to be able to perform their own analysis um, as the evolving fight uh, continues against malaria. Um, and I know Mikkel is going to talk a little bit more about humanitarian open street map, but through their amazing efforts, they mapped something like five million buildings or something <laughs> in a matter of a few months. Um, and being able to take advantage of that in something like Mapbox and Tableau, we're able to see where there is a predicted incidence of malaria outbreak likely to occur. And we, in this case, it's looking at what buildings have been sprayed with uh, insect, with 
uh, indoor residual spray, um, and we can see whether or not they refuse spray or not, so we can understand where they need to uh, continue to, to maybe implement other vectors or do testing for the parasite to hopefully eradicate the disease by 2021. Oh, I have one more slide. <laughs> One more slide. Sorry. Oh, one more slide. You want to continue? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, and this is just to kind of show the efficacy of the project is in the last three years. This is a dashboard showing where incidence is likely to occur with the beautiful map box satellite map in the lower left. And over the last three years, there's um, been a 92% reduction in malaria rated uh, deaths in Zambia, an 85% reduction in malaria cases. Obviously not due to a dashboard, but it's just one more tool in the wheelhouse that they're using to fight malaria. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a very good point. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't we want to don't want to take too much credit for what we do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that started almost 10 years ago, uh, called Map Kibera. Uh, Kibera is a large slum in Nairobi, Kenya. It houses maybe a population about the third of the size of San Francisco in an area of one-story structures about half the size of Golden Gate Park. It's a very dense place. Um, people have been living there for almost 100 years in this, um, this informal settlement. And in that time, they have created a neighborhood, almost a city unto itself, with pathways, with schools, health clinics, restaurants, movie theaters, um, many shops, industry. and. Um, that place in 2008, 2009, when we were starting, uh, think, getting this crazy idea of like, from the OpenStreetMap community, of, like, let's go to Kibera and help make maps. Um, that was a blank spot on the map. Any map you could find, government maps, Google Maps, OpenStreetMap, 250,000 people plus were not represented. So we thought, let's start an OpenStreetMap volunteer community in Kibera. Um, so we. We, we, uh, we went, a uh, group of us. Um, we connected with young people in Kibera uh, from all across the, the, the slum, 13 different villages. And um, they learned how to do OpenStreetMap, very enthusiastic. Within one month, they uh, made a base map, um, beautiful base map. Kibera was mapped. Um, and then we said, so what? <laughs> Great. We have a map. How is Kibera going to make use of that map? And that was 10 years ago. Um, five years ago uh, was the um, first presidential election. There's been a subsequent election in Kenya, but the first presidential election from the 2007, 2008 post-election violence in Kenya. Um, very, very shocking event um, in Kenya and around the world. Um, that, that led to starting um, Ushahidi uh, with Eric uh, Hersman is speaking later session at like 3, 3, 3.30. I'm going to talk about part of that journey. Um, so this was in 2013, the first presidential election. Um, and that was a time when finally, five years later almost, connected, well, what, what could maps do for, for this place? So the map became integral for, um, for uh, keeping peace, um, for helping to identify where polling places are. Um, even people who live there, maybe they know where some things are on their side of, of the neighborhood, but they don't know the other side. Um, and so it became a real part of the effort during the election. And as you can see, yeah, we make b beautiful maps um, at Mapbox. I believe we were making maps with Map. Yeah, we definitely were using, um, using Mapbox um, back then. But that's not really a map in Kibera something that's like on a computer. This is a map, you know, and this is a painted map on one of the walls in Kibera. There's also a lot of printing, so you'll go into a lot of different offices around Kibera, and there's maps on the wall, um, and that represents, they say, that's a real map, that represents the place. And since then, um, and even before, the project has, has expanded, and a core of the team, a core of the young people who started with us, who are really ambitious, but really, have had very few breaks in life, um, have not had the education that they've wanted, but very smart and want to do something for their community and for themselves. Uh, core of that team has stuck with us through like thick and thin um, and um, are now you know, professionals. Like they are some of the most highly trained people in mapping in Kenya and are called upon to help with mapping projects across the entire country. So just recently, 
they've been teaching people in government, in the Kenyan government, in the county level, how to map an open street map with the purpose of um, going to places like this, this water point, um, which serves part of, um, part of the Makweni County in Kenya. This was part of um, you know, spent public funds. They don't have maps of where all of the public investments have, have gone. They don't know whether the project necessarily has been completed or not or how well it's working. And so now the county folks have tools, and they're doing this right now, uh, today, collecting where these projects are, collecting other base map information, um, bringing it all into OpenStreetMap, bringing it into their own systems, printing maps, and um, this is just one example. I mean, it's a very simple map, um, but you know, having pictures, you know, you see that small picture of what was invested, what the state of thing, you know, is it complete or not? Um, a lot of, this one's complete. A lot of them don't end up complete for various reasons, and having that kind of inventory is something that's a very um, novel for them, and they're excited that they themselves can take part in the process of, of collecting the data. So I'll just rehash by saying, like, we started um, thinking that we were going to create an OpenStreetMap volunteer community like you might see here in San Francisco or like you would see in the UK when I first came across the project. And it looks very different when you get to uh, a place like Kibera. And what we ended up with was not a volunteer community that was organically spreading like open source software, but like very focused, you know, professional folks with professional relationships working with government very closely. So we didn't ex expect to end up there, right? And so to start off the questions, that's what I want to ask uh, you all is, what did you think you were building when you started? <laughs> and what have you ended up with? And, and what's, uh, what has influenced you along the way in your work with the people you're trying to serve um, to get to where you are? Great. Yeah. <laughs> I love this question because I think every project we've done has ended up so different than how we initially anticipated. So I guess there's two answers to that question. When I first started, co-founded Digital Democracy 10 years ago, we thought that our goal was to help local partners just learn the technology that existed and to help them adapt it to their needs. And along the way, we've learned that actually there aren't enough technologies being built based on the needs of marginalized groups, particularly ones that are in offline remote environments. So we became a tech building organization that we had not anticipated. And then secondly, when we started in the Amazon five years ago, um, our now technology director, my colleague Gregor, had already worked there for over 10 years. And we thought we were just testing whether it was even possible to make it easier to create maps in offline environments. There are, of course, many tools for map building, um, but most of the ones that work offline uh, are really difficult to use. And so actually, thanks to Mapbox's contributions to the OpenStreetMap community and creating ID Editor, we basically hacked ID Editor, changed the backend data structure so that it could be peer-to-peer -peer syncing rather than linked to the cloud, and we've um, created a tool called Mapeo that's uh, open source, works offline, is really easy to use. And all of the, the images you saw from just the brief glimpse of the Warani map, all of, they've now mapped hundreds of thousands of acres of territory using Mapeo in this offline environment. So actually, our, our kind of where we are now with our tool building has far exceeded my wildest dreams, um, which I think is really only possible because of that partnership and working directly with local groups. Um, well, when I started the project, I honestly thought we were just going to build three little dashboards in Tableau and be done. Um, that was three years ago. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, after finally meeting with the end users, we realized, as you saw the gentleman with the phones that aren't even smartphones, really a big help of them was just to receive data by SMS and be reminded to turn in data so we had accurate reporting on incidents. Um, so slowly, this partnership evolved to include Twilio, who was enabling text messaging so we could have these alerts sent back and forth. We're now looking at IVR to help do a little bit more of the data entry and data collection. Um, we expanded then to want to build predictive models to be able to better forecast malaria. And thanks to Mapbox, they're processing just layer after layer of things like where water is likely to pool, temperature, um, slope, elevation, as well as the malaria incidents to create a full forecast model. In order to do that, uh, Exasol joined in and volunteered large, massive database uh, processing power. 
for us. Um, and just last month, um, Bill Gates actually presented the work uh, to Theresa May and the Commonwealth Heads of State, and they're expanding the work that we're doing to eight countries in Africa. So from three dashboards to that over three years. <laughs> three dashboards to um, But again, like Emily said, it's really all these tech partners and people wanting to be involved and wanting to be, do good, and us realizing that you know, as we work to understand what the users really needed, we didn't have that as part of our stack. How did we go ahead and bring in other partners to be able to deliver something that was actually of use and of value to people in the field? Because ultimately, that's what we're doing. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I mean, what we thought we were doing at the beginning was just you know, putting together a public database of, of events by members of Congress. And that Google Doc I showed you is really functionally all that is. Like, we don't need anything beyond that to just get the core information of where are these events. Um, but what we discovered is you know, we, we weren't just a database, but we were like an advocacy tool. And it wasn't just where are, where are these events. It's why aren't there any events near me. And it's very clear when you, you know, show it visually that if the entire state of Montana has no public events, that means public servants in Montana aren't doing their job as public servants. Um, and we have become you know, an, an advocacy voice uh, to push lawmakers to be more accountable and more accessible. And it's something that you know, we, were, we started in response to a very specific moment uh, in our political landscape. But I think you know, regardless of which party's in power or you know, whatever issues are, are being debated, it's something that you know, we hope we can continue to be a voice going forward. And the, you know, the tools we're building and the way we are displaying them is, is to, to serve that end. That makes me think of a question that I feel like all of us could answer, which is how creating a map of something leads to all these other questions. Like, like you know, in your example, you know, oh, there's no, there, there aren't any events happening in the state of Montana, and then it leads kind of to these other questions that maybe are advocacy or other outcomes. And I'm curious for, for other folks, you know, what, what did the mapping in Cabrera lead to realizing about services that were needed or other things? And uh, yeah, there's, I here. mean, I think. One thing I've picked up on from from how Nathan has looked at his work is that there is you know this distinction between what do you need um, from data and from a map visualization to to operationalize. Do you need a map? Is an SMS actually enough? Um, and what function does the map um, really really take on? And I think there's definitely an operational aspect, but in so much uh, I think of of our work and of work where you are trying to to move things forward, there is a strong um, you know, creative advocacy element, this sort of symbolic element of the map. Um, and that's certainly been true in both, you know, when we started in Kibera, we were trying to think very operationally, like could we identify where there are ser service gaps? Um, and just the, the truth of the matter is, is that the situation is so complicated uh, in terms of services with the actors, there's various NGOs, there's government entities, Let's take like water systems, for example. There are cartels which uh, control access to the water and the pricing. And maps are not going to solve the problem. Um, but um, you know, within the election, there certainly was tangible operational things. But there was also this symbolic element of being able to see that place in its entirety. Um, again and again, we've had the, the team has had the experience. They also did a project with schools, and they mapped every school in Kibera, both formal and informal. And there's over 300. And they then printed the maps and just went back to the schools and handed them over. And these are folks that they had gone and asked for data from before, which is, which is a big topic in itself, actually getting, getting data. Um, and they never expected to see them again, because they're so used to people collecting data. And it's extractive, and it ends up in a database somewhere with a researcher. That's the usual pattern. Um, uh, Mike Davis has a book called Planet of Slums, which has a good chapter about Kibera, which is about this exact dynamic. And um, yeah, they were like, I cannot believe. Here's Kibera. Here's my school. We're on the map. And then look at all the other schools. Look at the school system that we have here. And so it's definitely like. A consciousness uh, raising event to just have that that total picture there. 
Yeah, I, I think with our project, a lot of it is operational and supply chain management mm. for what we're doing. But I think initially being able to go over there with these crazy satellite maps and modeled Veroni for facility catchment areas on these hub and spoke diagrams, none of which they ended up needing, <laughs> but it convinced them that you know uh, there might be something here, and these people are you know wanting to help us, and they they're able to understand where our resources are and be able to kind of support us in those. So I think it was helped us selling into getting the end user buy-in that we could actually provide value, hopefully. Um, and then it is very operational from our perspective. We want to be able to see, well, people aren't turning in data because it's rainy season and the water level has risen and the only way that they can turn in their data because they don't have cell phone access is via a bicycle or a horse, which in one meeting I got told they didn't turn in their data because a lion ate their horse. But <laughs> <laughs> But That's so an amazing able... variation on the dog ate my homework. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one was uh, the facility was closed because of witchcraft. Um, yeah. So anyhow, but being able to see geographically on a map what, what the problems that are affecting people from being able to do their job, I think, is really important to be able to understand the, the limitations that they have and the barriers that they have so we can then think of more creative solutions to be able to support them. Yeah, I mean, we were talking yesterday before this about how, whether you like it or not, a map tells a story, a map has a narrative. Mm -hmm. And you are, you may think, oh, I'm just objectively delivering information, but it, I think it's impossible to truly do that. You're conveying some kind of narrative and being, being aware of what that is. And, you know, we're, us being in the political sphere, we, you know, we have an opinion, we have a voice. Um, we don't want to push people to say, vote for this person, don't vote for this person. But thinking about, you know, what, what the narrative our, our map is telling and being the, the US political map, it's inherently part of a longer narrative that we're just joining in. So people see, see the map and they think of the 2016 <laughs> election night or they think of whatever. Um, it has its own, its own longer um, story that we are you know, contributing to. And one thing we have um, had the, the fun experience of, of dealing with lately is um, working with hundreds and hundreds of high schoolers uh, who are organizing mm. town halls around gun violence. And they largely don't have many of the same preconceived notions about the political map that we, you know, many people see like, oh, that's a red state or that's a blue state. And they don't, not that they don't, aren't aware of that, but they don't care. And the idea that like, oh, this person's a Democrat or this person's a Republican, or of course they're not gonna listen to me. It's like, what? No, <laughs> they, like, why do we pay these people money? Uh, and seeing they're just like, letting go the shackles of like the narrative that we've bought into about the map is is like liberating and exciting yeah. for us cool. to work with. Yeah, that that gives me a lot of hope to hear about the high school students and I'm I'm like been thrilled to watch how Town Hall Project and March for Our Lives have connected and uh, it, it it's just uh, yeah, that definitely gives me a lot of yeah. <laughs> a lot of hope. But something I wanted to um to to pick up on is the question of um, not how we're collect. I, there's a lot of interesting things on how we collect data. Sometimes you can, you can, you can, you can. Re it's about opening up data that already exists, or, or, or like, yeah, getting aligned to the person who has data who trusts you enough. Sometimes the data doesn't exist at all, and there's always issues around what you, on the data side, what you share out into the world for anyone to see, and what is, is more, um, more collected. And we know this are ourselves every day, we're, we're leaking data all the time, and it's unclear about what our individual privacy concerns are. Um, think about like, if you're really like in a community that's, that, that's at risk. Um, what, um, how like, the process of explaining what it means for collecting data and what it possibly could, could uh, be used for, I think is a very complicated one. So I'm very curious. I mean, I know we're, we're all in very different um, realms here, but I'm very curious, like, as far as um, the process of getting data, what, what's been, uh, what's, what's sort of like the, what do you have to really be thinking about when you're, when you're going to seek out creating data that will become a map? This is something that we think about a lot and that's become, I think, really central to the way we design our technology tools and the message we're trying to share, especially with other technology-focused nonprofits. And, you know, your story, Mikkel, I think is so powerful of the community, like the mappers going back and taking back the, da the data because that really just is so not the norm in international development. And because we're working with indigenous peoples who are fighting for their autonomy with, um, with national governments, it's especially critical that everything about the process that we do is around them owning their own data, controlling it, managing it themselves, um, 
trying to make tools that make that technically very easy and, um, and supporting them in their efforts. And so I mentioned that we kind of built Mapbeo, our tool, with a peer-to-peer -peer backend database. And first of all, that just makes sense for remote offline environments, but also means that they can control all of that information locally. They're not uploading it to the cloud where they have a risk of it getting hacked in some way. And, um, and then they can choose to share when and how they want on their terms. And I know that's something that other partners of ours, like Amazon Conservation Team is also here. Um, actually, we're both going to be um, tabling this uh, at lunch if you want to come learn more about our work. I think it's something that's really important and that people who are working with like in, in solidarity with indigenous people, we think about a lot, and I think it's something that can influence how other nonprofits think about marginalized communities and making sure that they, first and foremost, have the information because you know, malaria is coming out, it, who needs to know that most? Yeah, the ministry might need to know that, but a local community is gonna be the front lines of defense. So I think for all sorts of issues, not just, not just territory maps, it, it's a really powerful frame to look at that challenging the data extractivism and instead putting data in control of local people. Yeah. Yeah. Anything now? Yeah, no, I mean, similarly in our project, we, you know, we come in there and we go, oh, we think this health worker is located here, and that's simply not true. So being able to not forcibly say this is what the data is, but present it in a context of like, this is what we think, could you help us validate it? And Put, they're in charge, and in my case, because it is health data and it is owned by the Z Zambian Ministry of Health, it's not something that we're in charge of security, um, but it's really something that the people in Zambia are in control of and in charge of, and they're responsible for validating it and updating it and making sure it's accurate and complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the data we largely deal with is is lawmakers, um, you know, where they are at a given time, and there is some judgment in, you know, when when are they a public official who should be able to be confronted in a peaceful way? And when are you infringing on you know, safety, privacy, things like that? Unfortunately, in this country, you know, we've had Gabby Giffords, we've had the congressional softball practice. Um, you know, it's not hard, it would not be hard for us to publish every member of Congress's home address, right? Um, that data is not hard to get. If they're registered to vote, it's in the voter file. Um, we have made a conscious decision that that is not appropriate, um, that we do not want to be part of activists crossing that line into people's personal lives and their family. Um, but you know, with certain things, it is, it is a, you know, a more difficult judgment call of when, when are these public servants public servants and when are they private people. Um, and it's something that I think we've struck a good balance so far, but it's something we're always checking ourselves on. I wanted to also extend the invitation to anyone who would like to ask us a brief question. And we don't have a roving mic. So just shout, and I'll repeat. <laughs> so the question is, how do we incorporate feedback from the communities that we're serving? How do we actually make sure, after we're produce, producing something, that they're getting what they expected or what direction we should take? Um, I mean, one, I'll, I'll pick a very superficial example because our map, again, is, is largely emotional and symbolic. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, the data is coming to them um, in, in simpler ways. Uh, we had a lot of people from Hawaii and Alaska that were upset that you had to scroll over to see Hawaii and Alaska. And I was like, no, I mean, the map is global. They're, Hawaii is there. But they wanted it in a box <laughs> next to next to the rest of the United I States. Have done that a lot. And I, not being an Alaskan, I thought, well, Alaska is so big. Don't you want it like in all its glory? They're like, no, I want it in the box where I've always seen it, and that's really important <laughs> to me. Uh, and Puerto Rico and American Samoa. Put me yeah. back in my up. box. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, the idea that it's not just about oh, is 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 it there? It's where it's. Is it in the place of importance that means something to me? Yeah. Um, and you know, the same thing with like how blue we use a blue and how red we use a red, and conveying party and things like that. So the the sort of emotional response of our users is something that we're we're cognizant of. Hmm. Well, we're, we're um, 
we're not really releasing maps ourselves. We're really helping our partners release them. So everything we're doing is kind of in that very close partnership, and we're constantly incorporating their feedback. But one example of a question, a kind of really juicy topic recently, is that the Warani, who, whose story I shared briefly before, um, they live in the headwaters. So these are not where the, where the Amazon is really big, but where they're actually quite small, um, and many, many rivers. They've mapped more than 400 rivers in their territory. And none of the rivers in their cosmology and their worldview, and actually if you look at it with an objective eye, um, well, what color are rivers on a map? You can shout out the answer. It's not a trick question. Yeah, they're blue, right? But in Warani territory, all the rivers are green or brown or even black um, because that's you know, the rainforest. That's what it looks like. And so on the one hand, they want to create a river. They want to create a map that shows rivers that reflect what their you know, land actually looks like. And on the other hand, they know that they've got to get international support and national support to stop these oil companies from coming in. So for now, they've made a compromise, and their rivers are blue on the map. But we're also exploring with them, well, what will a different map look like where the rivers are green? And how will that you know, require educating the audience on these things? Um, and in our case, I work under the direction of PATH. Again, they're the global health innovator, and they're really the ones that are working with the folks on the ground, and we have this constant feedback loop. So I've been to Zambia twice just to sit and listen and watch how they're using the tools, really do more in-depth user studies. Um, and then also, once we've deployed the tools, actually monitor how they're being used and who is using them. And again, so that's all under the, the constant feedback loop of PATH, working with the local people on the ground and the Ministry of Health to ensure that we're building something of value. I mean, I think it's a really good question because it also suggests that you should be doing that. <laughs> and with uh, you know several many projects that have been a part of, there's many well-meaning people who want to provide a solution and they think they have something interesting and they very well they may have that, um, but it's only through conversation and dialogue and trust building and that testing of ideas, but being willing to you know having incorporating into the process um, you know change that you get to the point where something is actually going to um, fulfill a need that, that people actually have. It's not any different from how products are developed, successful products, I think, are developed in, you know, here in San Francisco. Um, however, it's something that um, I would say, like, the worlds that we, we work in often, often forget. Um, you know, I mean, I think Town Hall Project in itself is, like, is a corrective to feedback mechanisms, you know, that people do not feel that they can actually reach their representatives. Right. We shouldn't have to exist. It should be something that the government just does. But <laughs> it shouldn't be hard to find your, your representative's public schedule. We're glad you exist. Um, <laughs> anyone else have questions? Or Yeah, please. Okay, so we are, we are at a mapping conference. We, our company <laughs> called Mapbox. But when you want us to talk about when we shouldn't make maps, we can do that. We definitely can do that. Well, I think, I mean, a, ma a map can, obviously a map can do harm. You can distort reality with a map or you can create, you know, toxic narratives with a map. And, and also just there are, in, you know, speaking to our project, the American political map is, has some problematic aspects that, you know, you look at. You look at gerrymandering, you know, <laughs> a lot of our users have really discovered gerrymandering through, through their map, that their, their member of Congress is holding an event, and they're like, well, that's like 100 miles away, and they realize that their district goes like all the way through Pennsylvania, and they're like, what on earth? And they just weren't really that cognizant of it. Um, so, yeah, but I think, I think there are, are things you can do, you know, you, you can do harm with a map that it, that conveys, <laughs> conveys the wrong kind of information, and it's something that anyone making a map should, should think about. Um, so I do a lot of data visualization, and oftentimes people, oh, it's, geo it's geographic information. It has to be on a map, and that's not always the best way to communicate things. Sometimes a bar chart might be a, way more effective to show comparisons across states or things when it's not really necessary. Um, but I do have clients, like Visa, for example, I was building a, a customer segmentation dashboard, and it was really for brands at the national level, and talking to the account execs, they wanted, they're like, it doesn't matter, we don't need to see it on a map. But at the end of the day, the final dashboard that we built had a map, 
And I was like, why? And they were like, because it's just, it makes it relatable. It makes it understandable. I can, I can see it on something that's tangible versus a bar chart that's just this nebulous concept. So map, maps, I think, are very, people are tied to them because it gives, it's, it's a foundation for something. Um, and then also maps, I have a friend that just had to do a consulting gig for ExxonMobil and got to build maps to show where the polar ice caps were melting so they could drill more effectively. So that might be a case where, I really don't want you using a map, please. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's precisely because we're at a mapping conference and because we're all interested in maps that I'm so glad that we're talking specifically about power because that's what maps are. They are power. They are powerful. And maps were used to colonize the entire Americas. Um, maps were used to take land. Um, maps have been used to take land from people all over the world. And, um, and challenging that requires sometimes using those tools and reappropriating and changing them. Um, I showed the map of the oil blocks over, over Ecuador. Obviously, that's a map that has the power to not only erase cultures and languages and peoples, but also affects all of us because we depend on the Amazon for our future you know, in terms of climate. So I, you know, I think maps are really powerful in engaging that. And for our partners, you know, they're making very strategic decisions about what, what they share and what they don't, um, which is also, I think, really important. So I'll hand to here, and then we'll, we'll go back there. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, each of you mentioned uh, people on the ground at your locations being drawn in. I'm curious if you have stories about how individual lives were, mm. uh, were you know, turned because of what you're working Yeah, so the question is about you know, the people that we've worked with, the individuals that we've worked with. You know, what, what kind of impact has it had on their own personal lives? And I, I, I'll, I'll speak to that to start, because at, there's been points where one thing that's hard about, about doing this kind of work, it's, it is very hard to measure whether you are being effective or not. Oftentimes the results of, I think, I think in the case of, of malaria, there's very, you can measure, right? Like you're, we are, you're trying to eliminate malaria. So either there's malaria or there, there's not. Um, but when you are trying to empower a community or there's a part of a political process or improving services, it's also very hard to, to I mean, in any case, it's hard to detect, well, what was the cause? Did this intervention, this collection of data, did this map, is that what, what made the difference? Um, and so there's been times when I've been reflecting, like, well, what is it that has actually resulted from this? And the thing that I can definitely say is that the people that, you know, certain individual people that I've worked with, I am incredibly proud of how far they have come and where they were before, and I'm very happy that the work that we've done together was, was part of that. So for example, our, our lead mapper um, now with Map Cabrera, uh, Zach Mundry, started 10 years ago. Um, and he was one, part of the original uh, 13 mappers. Um, he show, he's very um, soft-spoken um, to start, and, uh, but, also, but very skilled, very analytical. And he took to it right away. And, um, and he stuck with it. And he's learned and challenged himself also in terms of public presentation. And so it's 10 years later. He was um, young. Now he's a father. And uh, like I see him, and I'm like, wow, I've known you for a lot of your, we've known each other for a lot of our lives. And you are training a group of government employees on how to make maps. And um, that's just phenomenal, uh, phenomenal to me. Um, anyone else want to want to add an a a <laughs> individual story from, from your work? Um, sure, I and mean, there's so many. Mm. I've really been transformed by watching actually some of the elders who, who maybe aren't actually doing, they're not taking the GPS coordinates, for instance. They might be more going on the walks and being kind of having the young people take video and testimony from them. But when the, when the paper maps get returned to each village, the, the, um, hearing one elder say, for, for decades, outsiders have come into our territory, told us what it is, shown us maps that I don't recognize. I recognize this map. This map, I worked for two months to get the, you know, to collect all the information for this map. Like, when the government comes back, I'm going to show them this map and say, no, this is our territory. Like, moments like that are just, you know, they floor me, and they really represent the power of, of people being able to, to hold that information themselves. Great. Let's take one, we're almost out of time. We'll take one quick question. And close up.
Yeah. Yeah, I have a quick anecdote from mapping in the West Bank, where like the representation, let's let's say this conflicted area, like the representation of Jerusalem on the base map of OpenStreetMap was in Hebrew, and this was very problematic for working with Palestinians because they also feel that Al Quds is the capital of Palestine, and um, I could say, well, in OpenStreetMap, you have all the trans like we have Arabic, we have we have English, we have Russian, um, but. What when they go to edit an OpenStreetMap, that was what they saw, and so the, this became a very complicated um, point of, of process. Anything yeah. to add on that? I've had to, I did a project for Nuclear Threat Initiative, and they work with global leaders to reduce or to support biosecurity and mm. biosafety. And in creating a map with like biosecurity scores by country, it was the same issue with the names of what's the naming convention that you use. Um, and it would it was like a month of meetings and back and forth before they would decide which label. And so in Mapbox, I had to like split out and in this case use the French label, in this case use this label. Um, and, yeah. so that's a, that's a good place to end. We yeah. can plug the multilingual um, <laughs> <laughs> um, option. You fully customizable. Sorry. Um, no. Um, thanks very much. Um, if you'd like to talk to any of us, we will be around. We have a community booth um, in the room. Um, get in touch with uh, the community team. If you have any ideas or projects. Um, we'd love to just hear about it and see how we could help. I think the rest of us are offering the same. Um, I have one announcement, and then Emily. Just wants really to add. quick, you can sign on to the Warani's petition to stop oil companies from coming into their territory. It's mm. a really simple action you can take. Probably many of our projects you could volunteer with, uh, and then I think all of our projects also could use support. So. Thank right. you. Can and I also say that's um, yes. that's not my ha hashtag. That's not my Twitter. I got. So I'm very sorry, Nathan. <laughs> was it some just snowboarders? That some snowboarders yeah. getting all these. Yeah, that's about. like a BMX <laughs> like um, at, at Town Hall Project. It's better. better. Okay, great. And always getting all these tweets about like political activism. Though. It happens all the time, fairly. <laughs> and just, um, I also want to invite you all to another conference in September, um, in DC, Sat Summit. So if you are interested in the intersection of map making and international development and global issues. September 19th and 20th, look out for SAT Summit. Thank you very much. Thank you.